Uh, hi, my name is Alex. I'll be giving a talk on unveiling secrets, harnessing Frida, Ghidra, and other decompilers for enhanced analysis of Android and Apple applications. So who am I? Uh, in short, my name is Alex. I worked at multiple consultancies, one of which uh, was doing MSSP work. Two was doing penetration testing, both for web, mobile, uh, let's see, <laughs> this is web, mobile, network, wireless, and social engineering. I've been doing it for a little over six years now. So for the purposes of this talk, we're going to be going over a couple of tools, Frida, a text editor, uh, Jadex, GUI, Ghidra, and Hopper. Some of these tools are gonna to be used for only one part of it, and some are used for both. Things like Ghidra and Frida are used for both, whereas Jadex and Hopper are operating system specific. So what is Frida? For those who don't know, Frida is a dynamic instrumentation toolkit. Uh, another way of wording that is it's a tool that pretty much manipulates the memory of different applications and gets information you normally wouldn't receive back. While there are definitely a lot of guides out there. I personally don't think there's enough guides saying how exactly you should use these tools, except for on iOS, you can use it to bypass jailbreaking conventions. So we're gonna go in a deeper dive with Frida, explaining what you can actually pull out from the different applications. Uh, one of the nice things about Frida is it's not limited just to iOS and APK files, you can actually use it on Windows or Linux or the actual Mac system and can attack all of those different processes. So text editors, this you can literally run on like Notepad, Notepad Plus. I'm a huge fan of Sublime and Visual Studio code. The purpose of this is because you're actually gonna be generating JavaScript code. Frida takes JavaScript code in and then that's how you access its internal APIs so that that way you can interact with the program. Uh, just a quick shout out for them. I'm a huge fan of GitHub Copilot because it does actually understand a little bit of what you're doing with Frida and it helps make writing redundant code a lot easier. And then again, the reason why I bring up a text editor, it's a little difficult to edit and save code if you don't have a means to edit and save said code. So we're gonna start off with the easy, more or less decompiler first. Uh, it's Jadex GUI. Jadex has two different sides. There's a GUI version and a non-GUI version. The non-GUI version will decompile the app, which is awesome, but makes analysis really difficult. So we're gonna I'm gonna showcase the GUI version of this. So one of the nice things about Jadex GUI is that out of all the interfaces you're gonna see on this presentation, it is the easiest to understand and least overwhelming. But one of the issues with that as well is it only works on Android. You can't use it for let's say attacking a Linux binary or a Windows executable, just Java based applications. Here's the GUI again. It's really nice and simple. You have this part that actually shows the file system a little bit, and then code that the Jadex believes is being generated. It is not perfect. So that is something to note. It, not only is it not perfect, it also doesn't always decompile all of it. So just two things to really note about this. Next is Ghidra. This is a really fun tool, very overwhelming. It was released, we're gonna call it released, by the NSA a couple of years ago. So this is more or less seen as a competitor to Ida Pro. While I'm sure there are people out here that have access to $10,000 to get Ida Pro, personally, I do not. And as a pen tester, it's a little bit hard to justify to my company, hey, can I have a $10,000 license, please? So they're not a fan of that. So for the purposes of this presentation, we're gonna use that a little bit more for decompiling both applications since it can actually work with both uh, IDA, IPAs and APKs. So one of the nice things about it too is that there's a lot of features that it has just outside of the main page. There's things like code flow and function graphs. So if you look at the code, you can actually get an idea of what's happening outside of just looking at raw uh, assembly. So I personally think it's definitely worth spending time learning 
and it will only help you. But again, one of the cons with it is because it is so helpful, it can do so many things, the interface is very intimidating. And when you first see it, you're not exactly going to know. For example, when I started this presentation, I had issues remembering where everything was, such as the namespaces. But as you can see, very intimidating, but this part is the, the this is the assembly portion. This is, every, in my opinion, everyone's favorite, the decompiled code. So you can see, it and it looks really nice on this portion usually. And you can also change variables. And then the really confusing stuff where you're actually tracing where all the functions are and where to go to. For the purposes of this presentation, you'll see it later. But namespaces are really helpful, so that way you can have a breakdown of the actual package names, the classes, and then functions. But you will we'll also run into another caveat with that. So for IPAs only, there is Hopper. Hopper is the only non-open source tool that we're gonna be using today, mainly because it's solely for Apple and Apple products. So you don't have to pay but the demo version is uh, 30 minutes with limited functionality. After that, though, it, it's not as intimidating, I have to admit. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, it doesn't run on Windows. However, it does run on a decent amount of Linux versions and obviously Mac OS. So if you're doing iOS testing, this is definitely a good idea to look into it. And the plus side is unlike Ida Pro, it's only $100. And you can keep on using it after a year, but you only get uh, one year of patches and support. After that, it's $100, but considering, again, not $10,000, a lot better. So this is how the assembly version of it looks. And then a much more manageable version is the pseudocode of a procedure. That is literally what the function is called. And it looks like that. So the last two important steps before we actually get into the content of this talk is how we're interacting with apps. So applications, for the most part, are interacted with in two different ways using Frida. You can hook into them directly by calling them. Uh, it's the equivalent of saying function, check function, and two variables. The other way, which is a lot more fun in my opinion, is when you're actually just uh, doing something called hooking them so that whenever the values are called or the functions are called, you actually get to see what goes into the function and more importantly, what comes out of it. The reason why that is really important is because in both of these examples that we're gonna show, you can actually modify the output. So that, that really does open up a lot more grounds for vulnerability than you would believe. So we'll go for the easy option first and we'll showcase Android. For uh, Android, calling a function is relatively simple. We have multiple versions of C where it actually looks like for the legend. Uh, everything that is underlined in red is a package name. Everything in blue is the different classes and green are the individual methods or functions. So for Ghidra, the Ghidra function, again, it looks confusing. However, you can see in the namespace there's the package names, then you see the actual class. In this case, it's class called check. And then under check, there is another function that is called uh, get flag. So if you look at the Ghidra code or the Jadex code, you will see that it wants the get flag and then whatever is passed to it, it wants an integer 1337. So you call said function, you throw in 1337, and then you get the secret from it, which is in the red box down here. It is a Frida XORD instance. So that's a really fun instance and a really simple way of starting to look at different functions. The next version is where the app is calling itself. We're not actually creating a new class instance and we are seeing what it actually returns and it goes in with. So again, you have the Ghidra portion that shows the namespace with the package name, the class, and the method, 
and then JADX has it as well. So from there, you can see that it's checking a statement. Is one, is first argument two times plus four. The first argument is a random number that the program actually generated at load time. And the second uh, function, or the second argument, sorry, is the actual argument that you supply. So if you look at the code, or the output of the code, right at the bottom, you'll see that the random number that the program came up with was 97. So the answer for 97 times 2 plus 4 is 198. So now you actually have the flag. It would show up on the actual application showing, hey, congratulations, you guessed this random number. So while that's really cool capture the flag instances, I'm sure many of you are wondering, who cares? It's a capture the flag. That's not going to help me during my assessment. Well, it's not just limited to different applications and their cool little capture the flag functions. There are other functionalities that you can have or hook into, for example, OK HTTP3 requests. This is a this is a package that actually sends requests to servers and get responses back. Another one that I'm a huge fan of is getting uh, the Java Lang string builder. And it will actually show whenever a function calls to string. So a way of to actually see it, again, here's the code showing, for example, util.log okay, HTTP3 request along with string builder. So when you go in there, you can see, hey, we have strings calling snack bar. We have an OK HTTP connection pool. And then we see that this URL is reaching out, or this application is reaching out to Allsafe and it's providing a authentication token. You can also see in this particular instance, it was logged. And then at the very bottom, you can see the request showing there was a get request and things of that nature. So where this is important, and I'm sure most of you realize, you can usually use Burp Suite to actually get the request information. The strings, a little bit harder, but some, usually it doesn't show up too much. Where this becomes important is if a server is running something such as mutual TLS or MTLS, where Burp does not let you connect because the server itself is saying, hey, are you authenticated? Do I know who you are? That's a really cool Burp suite, sir. I don't care. I'm not going to talk to you. So now, <laughs> you have a method to actually see what the requests were. In a nice, friendly environment, you can go and say, hey, we are not able to connect to this URL. Here's the payload. Please get this fixed. In a not so nice environment, you can say, OK, cool. This I need to go and find a cert for this. And strings sometimes can help you with that if the cert is loaded improperly. So now for the harder one, the Apple applications. All right, so it would decide to crash. Um, so I can I know the rest of the presentation from this part. Unfortunately, I will not have graphics on it. And that is going to be Apple applications are very different. The reason for their difference is because they actually make it a lot. First off, getting the IPA is very difficult. You usually have to use some kind of side loading technique just to get it on and to verify. The, to verify the producer. After that, you then have to go and decompile the IPA file that is not exceptionally friendly for this. After that, you then get to go and explore all the different functions. So there's free scripts involved that will actually allow you to go through and see app-specific methods. And then after the app-specific methods, you will then go and go play around with different methods to get them. And then after that, you will load up a different method, a different Frida script that will actually allow you to grab a different Frida script. You allow to see the specific methods, and you can see what is returned and what is actually given as an argument. From there, you will then use those scripts, and you can 
uh, adjust the different function name and class names along with the method and whether it's a instance method or a callable method to have it come back. And let's see if I can get this showing. Awesome. So this is an example of the app specific classes that you can run free to trace. From there you can see, hey, I did actually call it correctly. Then you can see the specific method. And then you can also use Hopper to get the same information. So putting it together, you can now see, hey, I call this function, here are the arguments passed to it, and it returns back a pointer, assumably to nowhere. So where does this matter? Why do I care about, again, another capture the flag instance? Well, if you're trying to bypass jailbreaks, jailbreak detection are usually using a couple of methods of saying, hey, are we using this application? Are we using this application? What's on this device? So if you can figure out what it's calling, you can actually tell it, hey, uh, return back nothing, or return back false, a native pointer to zero. And that is essentially what you can do with IPAs. It's definitely a lot more work to actually figure out what's being called and how it's being called. But if you spend enough time with it, you actually get something better than just saying, oh, hey, we called this func, we examined this binary and we just looked at the path. We used a static analysis tool such as MobSF. And you, know, you can actually get some really cool bounties that people didn't think existed because of user mistakes. So uh, the tutorials are used in this presentation were Frida Labs. I highly recommend anyone who wants to get into Frida start with those. And then the DVIA for Apple, this was a really nice repository. I found those actually used for jailbreaking. If you want to learn more, there's Frida Labs, Allsafe, and then for Frida on Apple, there's DVIA and this GitHub link, which actually has a bunch of resources that you can use for iOS. They also have it for Android, but Android is not exactly the uh, hardest thing to find scripts for. And then the references. Uh, this presentation will be under <laughs> under my actual uh, GitHub account and their presentation in Frida at the end of the conference. Uh, any questions? I realized that the timer went out, so there was supposed to be about 10 minutes more of content. Yes. Okay, so the question was, what other methods have I used to actually help with deobfuscation? So for that, I actually get really persistent with stuff. Thankfully, I have a large, usually large testing window. So I go through and I'll actually use Ghidra and Jad GUI or Jadx GUI to go through and see, all right, where are you in the code? That's really random numbers, but I will usually just go through and test every line just to see what's making the request because usually at the end of the day, they have to call something that is measurable to the actual Android application. Uh, any other questions? Awesome, well, uh, y'all have a great day. Uh, sorry about the mess ups with my computer on that. <laughs>